The Business of Agriculture podcast is brought to you by Land Trust. Did you know sportsmen spend over $5 billion annually in hunter and angler access fees? Land Trust is a platform that connects sportsmen with farmers and ranchers like you who have untapped profits just by providing access to their land. Go to landtrust.com slash BOA, as in business of agriculture, to see how much you might add to your bottom line. Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Business of Agriculture podcast. It's me, your host, Damian Mason. Got a fantastic program for you today. We're talking about something that we've never talked about in 203 episodes. We've never talked about sugar beets and North Dakota. I, um, I got to tell you that North Dakota is an interesting place. Um, I've got a lot of fans and friends there. And there's not a lot of people there. It's like 700,000 people in the whole entire state. It was about 1995. I was a budding and aspiring political comedian starting to really break loose. I did my first gig in North Dakota of my life. I landed in Bismarck. I remember we come down under the clouds. I looked out and I saw snow flying sideways and cattle. And I thought, good God, are we landing in somebody's pasture? And we basically did because that's Bismarck. Uh, anyway, so uh, I've always liked North Dakota. My friends get a kick out of it. I've uh, My friends make the point that between the two Dakotas, I've done like more gigs there per capita than anywhere else in the world. Um, we're going to talk about North North Dakota agriculture. We've got a, a guest here. His name is Jason Minke. He's the founder of Acres and Shares. Uh, he's going to tell you what that means, but essentially they're a land and, uh, and sugar beet brokerage business. He's going to tell you more about that. He's going to give us perspective on North Dakota agriculture. We'll talk about what's happening up there. We're going to talk about the sugar beet business, and we're going to talk about some other things as it pertains to the business of agriculture. So you're going to get some neat perspective from a guy named Jason Minke. If you're listening to this, we appreciate it. But you also can log on to YouTube and go to the Damian Mason channel because all of our podcasts are not only audios, they're also videos. Go to the Damian Mason channel on YouTube and please hit subscribe. It'll help my uh, my channel get more uh, viewership. And also you'll see good looking guys like Jason Minke. He's He's bald-headed North Dakota dude, uh, and you will see him here on this. So anyway, Jason, welcome to the Business of Agriculture. Thank you for having me. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, you'll notice my background is a, a basically a wheat field and American flag. So I had Damien on my Well-Grounded podcast, and he basically said that North Dakota should have nothing less than just wheat and CRP. So I thought the background was fitting for this podcast. Yeah. So I was on his well-grounded podcast, dear listener, and they were talking about the corn crop of North Dakota. And I said, and this is the problem. You don't need to be growing no corn and soybeans up there. You leave that to the I states. You leave that to us here in Indiana so I can charge more cash rent. You people in North Dakota should grow wheat and, and snow and, uh, and maybe some CRP ground. Anyway, we know that there's a lot of beautiful agricultural land in North Dakota, all kidding aside. You're in the eastern part of the state. I have worked there before for some potato people and for the sugar beet people, in addition to all the other stuff that I've done in North Dakota. Tell us a little bit about what your business does, acres and shares. What do you do? Sure. So in in late 2018, I started my own company and I wanted to find a a name that was unique. A lot of people in the real estate business, their company is basically named after their last name. And uh, that's not the route I wanted to go. So uh, when I started my own company, I looked at farmland brokerage. So that would be the acres. And then the shares would be American Crystal uh, Sugar Beet shares. So uh, primarily I broker land in North Dakota and Western Minnesota. And then uh, as of now, uh, American Crystal is the largest sugar beet cooperative in the nation. Uh, they have five factories in the Red River Valley of North Dakota and Minnesota. Um, they have roughly a half million outstanding shares. And on any given year, there's roughly uh, 1% of shares that's brokered. Um, in addition to acres and shares, there's also a few other firms that do broker shares uh, and one of the things I do on a, on a weekly basis during the season, so a sugar beet stock, it's primarily brokered from, from fall until spring. So I'll kind of keep a running tab of, uh, of all of the brokered shares kind of throughout the season. Okay, so uh, to our listener, <clears throat> we have all kinds of people listen to this, you know, people that are in the feed, seed, chemical, uh, machinery business. We even have some non-ag people listen to this. Okay, I joked about North Dakota, you should just grow wheat and have your ground in CRP. But there's, again, an amazing fertile uh, area, particularly in the eastern part of the state over there between Grand Forks and Fargo. 
uh, and it's the Red River Valley uh, part of the world. Um, <clears throat> you're, uh, you're you're talking about deep, rich black soil, and they grow uh, potatoes there. I know, and then also the sugar beet people. A lot of folks don't know this, Jason. <clears throat> I've worked for a lot of sugar beet organizations. The majority of the sugar that Americans eat comes from beets, not from cane. The average person that lives in the suburbs next to me in Phoenix, Arizona, where I live half the year, doesn't know that. They think of sugar cane. Um, tell me about the sugar beet business and what you just said. You you are a broker for that. It's a controlled amount. I mean, the most of the sugar not only comes from beets, but it's also all in a cooperative arrangement generally, right? Yeah. So really when I say that I'm brokering shares for American Crystal, I'm, I'm a third party broker. I'm not employed or affiliated with American Crystal, but we work closely with their shareholder accounting area. So in order to grow uh, an acre of sugar beets, um, you know, years ago before we, we started increasing yields, um, basically owning one share allowed you to plant one acre of sugar beets. And now as the yields have grown through technology, and agricultural advancements um, for 2021 with Merit and Crystal, you could plant, uh, they had a planting tolerance of, I believe, 78 to 83% of a share. Okay. So what's that mean? So that means if you own, if you own uh, 100 shares, that gives you the ability to plant a minimum of, of uh, 78 acres or a maximum of 83. Okay. Uh, in a perfect world, what Merit and Crystal is trying to do is they would like to, through their five factories, they would like to process roughly 11 and a half million tons of sugar. Uh, about 12 million is, is kind of their cap on what their factories can process. Um, so right now, looking at the 2021 crop, uh, because beets are a, a perishable item, and just a little background for the cranberry folks out there that you occasionally reference in your podcast. So when you picture a sugar beet, um, maybe think more of a, a turnip. You know, you're not looking at a, at a red beet. Um, it's it's a, a pretty hearty um, uh, vegetable. It's about it's, the size. It's about the size of a football. I mean, they're pretty big, right? Yeah, yeah, roughly, probably anywhere from from two to five uh, uh, pounds. And you know, historically, when we were kind of at our at our peak, we've had some weather related issues in recent years, but. You know, I think American Crystal would like to see roughly a 29 to 30 ton crop per acre. And uh, this year, because of the drought conditions in the Red River Valley, and just kind of a side note, we really the valley extends from the Canadian border, um, you know, down to, to roughly Fargo. Um, but the drought conditions that we've seen, um, American Crystal released some information last week that they're looking at roughly a, a 25 and a half ton crop, which would put them at 10 and a half million tons of, uh, of processed sugar. Yeah. So they're going to be under capacity because of the drought conditions. We're going to talk a little bit about that later, but yeah, you know, I said, we're getting perspective on North Dakota ag and particularly about the sugar beets. Cause like I said, in, in all my episodes, I've never done this. I have spoken to no less than half a dozen different sugar beet uh, audiences. And again, what you're just explaining right there would be really lost on most people. The average person uh, in the United States of America thinks that uh, they, you know, they saw the thorn birds where they saw somebody out cutting sugar cane in Australia and they think that's where sugar comes from. But again, it comes from these football sized beets that are grown in North Dakota, Minnesota, Wyoming, Colorado, uh, a little bit in California. Uh, Montana has a, a pretty active uh, sugar beet business. So it's very controlled. You know, if I just want to start planting sugar beets out here in my farm in Indiana, I can do that, but I ain't going to be able to process them because nobody's going to take them. Isn't that the way it works? Exactly. Um, as I mentioned last week, they started what uh, what American Crystal deems or terms as as pre-pile. So really what they'll, their full harvest campaign starts on October 1st. And there's a variety of reasons that go into that, but part of it is just the storage of beets. So by the time we hit October, things have cooled down, but they'll start a pre-pile, depending on the size of the crop, anywhere from early to, to mid to late August. And the whole intention is to get the factories up and running and, and starting to process sugar. But uh, it's quite the production. Um, you know, with these five factories, there's also numerous outpiling stations. So, you know, the... The harvest process is actually quite unique as well. So they're they're digging these beets, they're loading them into to semi trailers uh, that have the the right capacity to to dump at these piling stations, 
And it's it's 24 seven when we get into the the heart of the the beet harvest in October. Excuse me, sneezing. My allergies are acting up. Okay, so you start harvesting right now. We're recording this at the end of August, so you're record. They're harvesting right now. Yes, and they'll be harvesting until the snow flies. You know, in a in a perfect world, we'd last year we saw I think maybe a 17 day harvest. Um, but the unique challenge with these sugar beets. So if we if we go back two years to 2019. Um, some of my farmer friends had their best sugar beet crop ever. And we had a really wet spell in September, October. And there were guys who had to leave 40 ton beets in the field. So think record, record crop. And back to the goal of, of processing 11 and a half million tons that year with the wet disaster, they ended up harvesting seven and a half million tons. And, you know, fortunately there was a disaster bill, um, the whip program, and I can't think of what that acronym stands for, but um, they were actually able to funnel that through the cooperative and that helped out, uh, you know, tremendously. Yeah. So uh, you're talking a lot of uh, sugar beet uh, vernacular here, just a couple of things. Um, you, know, you talk about the capacity and all that. <clears throat> One thing that you know, if you've been in agriculture is sugar tends to be pretty regulated. Uh, there's, there's government policy uh, on sugar. Um, again, if I wanted to go out here and plant my fields to sugar beets, I could do that, but I ain't got where to take them. So that's where the ownership comes in. You are a broker of these shares. You said that there's 500,000 outstanding shares within the American Crystal, the largest sugar cooperative in North America. Uh, you said about 1% of them. So you're talking about 5,000 of those 500,000 shares change hands each year. Um, tell me what that means. Like, do I want to own those shares? Because I really don't, because the only reason I don't know shares is uh, that I have a place to go to, I have my slot, my slot in the factory to take my beats, right? Right. And even in, in your scenario, so American Crystal has kind of a map of where they would like to, or require the beats to be grown, to be able to, to haul them to either a piling station or a factory. Uh, one of the changes that they made uh, recently, um, in fact, I think it kicks in uh, very soon, like the end of August or, or first part of September is, let's just say you had grown up in, in North Dakota and you're, instead of growing up in a dairy farm, you grew up in a sugar beet farm, you moved to Indiana and you still had those shares. Uh, so for the people who, who moved away, they've retired, inherited shares, um, they've been grandfathered in to continue owning their shares, but um, somebody looking at this from an invest listing from California, New York, and thinking, hey, this would be a great investment opportunity, um, that is no longer available. Basically, you need to be either an active farmer or have family that's close family that's actively farming these beets. Because, you know, really the intent with a cooperative is to have, have uh, grower owners um, that, uh, that deliver a product to, to that cooperative. So they're, yeah. they're really trying to get back to the roots of the, you know, intention when they started the cooperative. Yeah. The cooperative that, uh, you know, it's, it's in its incarnation was that uh, we all get together, we pool our money and we then also process our own crops. We get the value added profit margin from doing so. And, uh, and that's the purpose. So I can't buy shares in American crystal. Can you? No. And in, in fact, the, the, uh, I don't know. And when we recorded the well-grounded podcast, you were joking around about the Chicago investor and, you know, kind of similar with beat stock, you know, kind of the vernacular was, it was the dentist in, in Minneapolis or right, right, attorney right. in Minneapolis who, who owns all of these shares, but in, in general, they were just handed down through the family. But, you know, just think of, uh, of the family that moved off the farm and now they've got kids in their twenties that are inheriting shares and they might've seen a, a picture of a beet field, yeah. you know, from grandma and grandpa hanging on the wall, but they have no clue what, uh, what this ownership means. Uh, and, and you know what, speaking of sugar beets, I have a sugar beet tie that uh, the industry gave me when I did a speech for the sugar beet people. And I wish that I had thought to put it on for this podcast because now we're telling people to go and, and watch this on YouTube. They could see me in my sugar beet tie. Um, what Jason mentioned right there is he is, uh, the host along with the red river, uh, radio network, <clears throat> uh, a podcast called well-grounded. So obviously you can check it out the well-grounded podcast, but he also was making reference to, cause he's got a good memory. 
he's, he's interesting like that. Uh, you know, my comedy background taught me to always connect dots, but he's doing a pretty good job. He's not really that funny. I mean, frankly, if you were watching, if you were watching here, he's bald, he's bald headed, he's got big spectacles and he's, he's a, a, a sugar beet broker for God's sakes, but he's actually pretty clever. Anyway, uh, what he's referencing there in the, the episode we just recorded for him <clears throat> talking about land values was the, uh, the issue of, uh, that I have said forever, every land auction I go to every farm auction I go to here in Indiana, then you talk to the, the, the farmer crowd, especially the more bumpkin-y farmer crowd, uh, you know, the kind of people that go and hang out at the diner and talk about all the hard day work every day. Who bought that ground? Oh, it was, went for a lot of money. Must have been some investors from Chicago. So every land auction I go to and they ask me to put on a name tag, I just write investor from Chicago on there, uh, which is my favorite thing to do. Um, because remember, every piece of farmland that gets sold at, for a high dollar amount, it must have been from some investor from Chicago. Okay. And th thanks for picking on the fad kid from, from North Dakota. You know, actually, uh, actually, you, you, you're holding up all right. So speaking of North Dakota, North Dakota, my, my one of my all time favorite states, I want you to give me a little background on you because you and I have a few things in common. Before we do that, I want to remind our listeners that uh, in addition to the good people at uh, uh, Land Trust who sponsor this podcast, I have a new affiliation with Extreme Ag. Extreme Ag is a consortium of six farmers. They founded this. They're record setters. They're kind of guys that set records with the soy and corn bean and, and corn uh, associations. Uh, and they set up this thing called Extreme Ag. Extreme Ag is a place where they have a website. You go there, you can watch videos, product trials, uh, podcasts that we now are recording called Cutting the Curve. So I'd encourage you, if you want to up your farming game, to go to extremeag.farm. There's no E, just X dreamag.farm and you'll see me and along with all these dudes that are putting these cool things together product trials and product and, and, and machinery and all kinds of great stuff they're doing plus then this new uh extreme ags cutting the curve podcast that i'm producing for them so please check it out extremeag.farm okay jason minke 50 year old norton accordion didn't want to be in agriculture tell me that raised out there and the, raised out there and the in the, in the snurt area, by the way, nobody knows what snurt is. That's when snow and dirt mingle during the winters, which only last from sometime in October until sometime in May up there in North Dakota. Uh, anyway, snow and dirt, snurt. Anyway, tell me your background. Now you're, you came full circle. Didn't want to be an ag. Grew up on a farm and went broke. Give us the scoop. Exactly. So I, I grew up, I graduated from high school in 89. And, you know, we may be farm 500 to 1,000 acres the the uh, drought in the late eighties uh, was, was pretty, pretty harsh on our farm. Um, we had, uh, we had about 20 head of cattle. And so I got to walk fence line plenty. And I swear the only time the cows got out were, were either Friday night at about 10 o'clock when you wanted to go partying with your buddies, yeah. or maybe the next morning at five o'clock when you wanted to, to sleep in a bit. Yeah. Uh, so I went to college with the intent of getting a business degree and, uh, then when I found out I couldn't uh, ace all the accounting and math classes, I, I reshuffled my major probably five to 10 times and finally settled on, uh, on communication. And so my first uh, part-time job in communication, the sports editor at the Grand Forks Herald, I filled out the application and he, he asked to see my hand and he, he felt for a pulse and once he, he felt that I had a pulse, he hired me. Uh, that, that transition to, to getting to know some people with Ag Week magazine, which is a regional farm publication up here. And I, I started there as an intern. Uh, later, that developed into, uh, into doing some clerking and then eventually some writing. So um, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm running away from agriculture, and I'm kind of right back, right back in it again. Um, and who knows, I'd maybe still be a journalist if, uh, if uh, I think the first year my salary was going to be nineteen or $24,000. And, you know, I didn't want to be broke all my life. <clears throat> you started Acres and Shares, and then you came back to it. Uh, it, was, it, it was for the sugar beet thing, but then also you do land. So that's our next thing. We've gotten the perspective on sugar beets. Uh, now let's talk about the real estate up there. Um, real estate in general, going crazy. My house in Arizona, up 20%, they say, from you know one year over year. Uh, farmland, depending on which publication uh, you look at it here in Indiana, some are saying 12, 14% year over year. 
Is it happening up in your part of the world also? Yeah, we're just not as, as those numbers aren't quite as strong up here. Um, we, we've got more weather related, uh, you know, issues. Crop insurance is a big thing for us up here, uh, in the Red River Valley, you know, the crops that are growing are, uh, you know, the, the further, further South you get in the Valley, you're going to see more corn and beans. And, uh, depending on if their sugar beets in rotation, um, Northern part of the Valley, uh, you're going to see a rotation of probably wheat, soybeans, possibly canola, uh, and then, you know, that's uh, also Western North Dakota, you're going to probably see a rotation of either, you know, wheat and beans or wheat and canola. Um, you do see some corn, but, you know, we, we just have different growing environment up here. Um, I've, I've heard from numerous farmers that, you know, probably their happiest day in the last five years was selling their corn heads. So they'd never have to worry about harvesting corn again in, in March. <clears throat> yeah. I think that's, again, I want to reiterate that I, I want you to not grow corn up there because we'll take care of it here in the I States. You just stay the hell out of the corn, but uh, to give credit to the North Dakota, uh, 87% of the United States canola production happens in your fair state. Um, and then, like I said, uh, over where you are on the East coast on, on North Dakota's East coast, it's a different world than, than the Western and central part of North Dakota. Yeah, and I can't speak specifically about prices, but I know in visiting with farmers in the last week or two, uh, you know, similar to the other commodity prices, but I think canola is even a little, little crazier than, than most of the commodity prices, just because of the, you know, the drought conditions that we've seen up here. Yeah. So what is that doing? You said that the numbers aren't quite as strong. If I wanted to buy, <clears throat> if I want to buy a 160 acres uh, within 10 minutes of where you're sitting right now, how much am I going to pay for it? some of the best stuff? So some of the best stuff in the Valley probably capped out in 2012, around 10,000 bucks an acre. Um, I would say on the, on the top end, and there aren't many sales out there to support it, but you're probably seven to 8,000. So we're, we're maybe still 20% off the peak. Yeah. The Purdue webinar that I tuned into a week and a half ago uh, about land values here in, in the Indiana, uh, they're saying, you know, up 12 to 14%. And they're saying, you know, top, top ground, you know, averages in across the state and that 9,200 per acre. But when you look at their map, uh, and if you're, if you're bored, I'll hold this up. If you happen to be online, uh, they do the, uh, they do the price per acre and they just take the state and divide it into six regions. You know, you're talking about, uh, some areas are pushing 12 grand. That's just for the average top, um, stuff. My part of the state, you, you know, we'd call it, uh, $8,100 an acre out here, uh, outside my back door. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's going to be pressure on this. And I think you and I both agree that there's not a lot of stuff. There's not a lot of inventory right now. Um, I think in an average year, we have what 3% of farmland transitions, I believe is the number that my real estate guys tell me. I'm not sure it's going to be that high. What is your perspective up there? No, I, I think you, uh, you hit it on the head. Um, you know, a lot of my business historically, you know, dating back to, to 2000, has been a lot of uh, a lot of family type transitions. So you know, let's just say you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and you you own property with uh, three or four siblings, and you're starting to do some estate planning. Um, you know, we'll we'll see some of those transitions. Um, but you know, by and large, probably the the boom of this thing was was back in 2012 was probably the you know the craziest year, and we've seen probably average to less than average volume since then 2012 you referenced it twice i called 2012 the high water mark i was wrong it actually was 2013 heading into 2014 was the high water mark i missed it by about a year and a half <clears throat> and um even then there were still some deals to be had there was a property a mile from where i'm sitting right now that uh, i should have i should have bought i had the bid on it and then uh, it dawned on me that i didn't have um, i didn't have anything coordinated or anything i just was more going to be a spectator. And then I had the bid. <clears throat> so what they're saying here, the report that I read is that while we are at a nominal high, we're not at a real dollar high. The real dollar high was indeed 2013, 2014 in terms of adjusting for inflation, but we are at a nominal high here in the state of Indiana on agricultural real estate. But again, adjusting for what real dollars, it was uh, seven, eight years ago. <clears throat> so anyway, is it going to continue? I see a lot of money. I mean, do you have people that call you up and they say, man, I'm the dentist in Minneapolis, as you would say, I've got a, I've got a couple hundred thousand dollars to deploy. Where can I put it? Do you have that? 
You know, there, there's some of that, but uh, we see in in eastern North Dakota and western Minnesota, we we see fewer investors than you would probably find down in the in the I states. You know, so that percentage is maybe five to ten percent, as opposed to you know maybe 30, 40 percent in your neck of the woods. Right. Uh, but you're you're totally right. There's a lot of money even on the farm side. Um, I put together in addition to the podcast, I do a, a newsletter twice a year. And if you look at uh, 2020, because of the various government payments, uh, net income, I believe on a national level, net farm income was back, it was the, the highest since 2013. So it's kind of an interesting <coughs> correlation with your, you know, your numbers on, on the peak and, you know, seeing where we're at with, with uh, land values right now. So, you know, based on... <coughs> What they call, what, what, by the way, what did they call it <clears throat> last year? What did it, it was like 130 billion of farm income. Yeah, it was something crazy like that. And it was just a huge, it was probably a record uh, right. government payment. Well, yeah, the government threw $51 billion in the year 2020 at agriculture, which was a, a never seen before historic record amount. But then when you realize that the government threw a billion here and a trillion there, uh, what the hell? I mean, 51 billion sounds like chicken feed now uh, when, when they're passing $3.5 trillion of alleged infrastructure. And, and I never knew that welfare was infrastructure uh, or paying for people to go to, uh, uh, you know, to, to have their student loans re resolved uh, debt free meant that that was infrastructure. But but I do digress. Anyway, so the, the balance sheet's really good. Um, I think the cow calf people are not so good. I think the feedlot people are not necessarily good. They tell me that tree fruit uh, is struggling. That's something that we don't do a lot of around here. And I don't have as many contacts. And I do have a citrus producer friend in California. And they tell me their numbers are not good. Um, but other than that, the farm bill's pretty flush, right? It is. And I, I think, you know, when you look at... Uh, we're kind of back to more of a seasonal pattern for land sales. So, so sure. You're going to see some sales in the summer, but back in that 2011 to 13, 14 range, it didn't matter when you sold the farm, you know, it could have been the middle of the summer. There was just enough cash out there. Yeah. But I think we're seeing more historical patterns of, of sales from fall till spring. So I know, you know, I've got a couple of sales lined up for, for fall and, and, you know, there's some uh, competitors that do as well. So it'll be interesting to track that, but I mean, all the signs are indicating to, to a stronger land market heading into fall. Um, I don't know how things are around here. We, we do auctions. Uh, a friend of mine just sent me a notice for an auction next County North and then chunk it up into tracks, sell it off at auction. Uh, is it more private treaty up where you are? Or is it auction? It really depends on the type of ground. You know, the good, good farmland um, is, uh, is either auction um, or one of the things that, uh, that I started doing as a, as a sales associate. And then, you know, now a broker on my own is I do a lot of sealed bid sales. Um, and really that's just submitting a one-time sealed bid. And kind of the logic behind that is there's a lot of pockets where there's just fewer, especially if there's no investors in, in an area, uh, where there's just fewer and fewer buyers out in the market. And, you know, there can be cases where there's a, there's a pretty big gap between what, the buyer is willing to pay and what somebody is willing to bid them up to. <clears throat> really? So um, you're saying you think you get more money when it's not a competitive bid, uh, public bid. You think that, that all of a sudden you think you do, do better that way. It, it depends on the property, you know, but we we're seeing, especially uh, in the last two years, I would say most of the auction companies have, uh, have transitioned to online auctions. Mm -hmm. When you get sealed bids, is there a huge, uh, is there a huge spread? You know, I sold my timber uh, sealed bid and three of them you could cluster. It was like going back to statistics class, three of them you could cluster. They were within about a percent of one another. And then there's the outliers like, what the hell? Were they being even serious? This is, this, I, I, I wouldn't sell them a tree out of my yard for this little bid, let alone my woods. Uh, what do you discover? No, exactly. And, and that's, that's really one of the benefits to, to sellers of going that route. Um, you know, uh, auctioneers will tell you that, uh, you know, the auction process will give you the value of that day, but in some cases you just don't have the right parties there to, to get it to the level where it probably should be. And so I've just, I found a lot of success and maybe if this thing continues to get stronger, um, I do have the ability to do auctions and, and that'll certainly be, 
you know, something that's in my toolbox, but I'm not just, you know, set on, on, on auctions uh, per se. Acres and shares <clears throat> in your business. And if people want to check it out, they go to acres and Is that where it is? Absolutely. That's the best way to reach me. There's a phone number, email address, all that sort of fun stuff. Here's a question, Jason. Um, you, you know, you're, you're dependent on there being a transaction. So uh, what happens to your situation when uh, there's no land sales and there's also nobody that's wanting to move their American crystal sugar stock, then uh, you're you going to go and wait tables. What's going on? You know, kind of the beauty of my business. So when I started in the, in, in the industry, I also had, uh, mainly for coverage, but, um, I had to spend all of my summers, uh, in the office, but with technology of, uh, you know, just look at you spending time in Indiana and Arizona and places in between, uh, it, it's kind of nice. I've got a little bit more downtime in, in the summer to enjoy at the lake or play a little bit of golf. Um, they, especially with the, my busy season is fall till spring. So, you know, kind of that farm kid mentality. Um, I don't mind working Saturdays or Sundays when, uh, you know, make hay while the sunshine kind of deal, but uh, uh, haven't had to wait tables or pick up a <clears throat> license yet. Yeah, no, I've been out here. I've been out here hacking it out for 28 years now. I'm in my 28th year, uh, you know, quit my job to become a political comedian, then morphed into this and, you know, being the ag outlook and commentary guy uh, and several things in between. So um, it's, it's neat to be, uh, they like to say you're your own boss, but the reality is we all work for our clients and our customers. So we, uh, we're all beholden to the marketplace. And I took up golf, just like, you know, you and I have a lot in common. We're almost the same age and we've, uh, we, we suffered through the bad eighties and we uh, are back in the industry. We thought we weren't going to have a place in back, uh, back when we were kids. And then I took except that. I, except I'm funny and you're not. Yeah. Well, it's pretty obvious. Uh, and I have hair, but uh, other than that, we we've got a lot in common. So anyway, a uh, good perspective on sugar beet stuff, North Dakota stuff, closing thoughts, anything that may be like the person that's listening to this is like driving around, you know, my, my, uh, my, uh, my hypothetical cranberry producer that's uh, tuning in uh, that doesn't know anything about what happens in North Dakota. What, what do you think? What's the perspective? What's your thoughts? It doesn't even have to be about North Dakota. Give it to me. You've got no shortage of opinions. I've obviously discovered. Well, in, in being a North Dakota farm kid, um, one of the perspectives is, as you mentioned, we have kind of a smaller population. Um, and, and part of that is really uh, back to you flying into North Dakota in, in the winter and, and seeing the snow and, and the dirt. And we always joke that, uh, you know, the 40 below days, it, it keeps the riffraff out. Yeah. So I landed and, and uh, I think it was my first trip there. It was uh, a guy with the North Dakota Grain Dealers Association. And he had on a button that said 44 below keeps the riffraff out. And I'm like, you're damn straight. I, if, it, if it hadn't been for a signed contract, it would have kept me out. Uh, but I do love the state. I like working there. I've been all around. My grandfather, when uh, he came over to this country as a kid from England, uh, he worked in Minot, North Dakota, milking cows for people. And I was too young to remember, but I heard the story then from my dad and brothers that he used to talk about they had the bunkhouse and then they had the barn where the cows are and they had to tie a rope. So that way, when you went uh, to the barn or from the barn back to the bunkhouse, you you climbed along the rope going back because the wind was blowing snow so fiercely that you would get lost and you would die out there if you didn't have the rope to get you from one place to the next. Does that sound familiar? It's probably real. <laughs> His name is Jason Menke. You can go to Acres and Chairs and check him out. I also, while you're checking stuff out, please go to the extremeag.farm. That's my, my new affiliation where I'm helping these guys produce some really good content. So if you're a farmer and you want to see what's happening, some new progressive stuff, some forward thinking stuff, you know, some trials, go to extremeag.farm and check out all the great stuff we're doing there with the Cutting the Curve podcast, as well as other videos and audio content. Till next time, thanks for being here, Jason. Thank you. You betcha. So anyway, until next time, it's the business of agriculture. Thank you for tuning into the Business of Agriculture podcast sponsored by Land Trust. Land Trust partners with farmers and ranchers to capture pure profit from sportsmen seeking new experiences and places to hunt and fish. Land Trust built the platform and does the marketing. You maintain 100% control of access and activities and you set the rules. There's no cost or obligation when you list, and the next 10 Business of Agriculture listeners who go to landtrust.com BOA are eligible for a gift worth over $2,000.